Thank you for coming. Let us worship together. But I want to invite you to remain seated so you can see the children as they process to, uh, among us. Praise is rising. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. I see the king of glory. Let us stand to worship. Coming on the clouds with
Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and form, foam and the mountains quake with their surging. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God and I will praise him. This is my God and I will exalt him. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Wonderful, so wonderful. Your unfailing love, your cross was spoken, mercy over me. Now I have seen no ear as heard, no heart can fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are, beautiful. 
So that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. He takes care of the sparrows but says he cares much more for his children than the sparrows. He provides and is attuned to our needs. He goes after every single lost sheep until it is found. He pursues a relationship with us and doesn't ever get tired of looking after the lost. I heard a thousand stories of Speak your love, but I've heard the tender whisper of love the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleasing and I'm never alone. You're a good, good Do you are? 
Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Next Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Amen. For he walked out. Lord, I thank you for days like today where you remind us not only of the victory that you have won, but the victory that you offer us to walk in right here and now. Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts and mind to your truth again on this day. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Doing okay? Well, welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday. You know, as, as I was thinking about this Palm Sunday, uh, I'm reminded of that original Palm Sunday, and it's on days like this we talk about that Palm Sunday, and we talk about the, the cheers of Hosanna, 
Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you've probably heard a sermon or two that it's the same crew, the same crowd, that it doesn't take too long. Those cheers of Hosanna turn to a jeer of crucify him. There's a mode of celebration that turns to a funeral. It's kind of like, well, which is it? What, what should we celebrate and, and what is happening? You know, I, I think that it was something other than the real victory that was being won for them. It was a victory in their mind of what they had hoped to see, of what they thought would come with, with new power or a new kingdom or something tangibly that would align with their hopes and dreams. And as soon as that would slip away, as soon as their dream looked like it was dying, they shifted and they began to walk the path of crying out, crucify him, going from a celebration to a funeral, going from the celebration of hope in all things exciting to a declaration of death. You know, I think sometimes on Palm Sunday, we too can be straddling the fence. Oh, culturally, we know what Palm Sunday is. It's, it's where we have the kids come out and, and do what they just did. They wave the palm branches. It's kind of the alarm clock that, well, I guess Easter's coming in seven days, and so I better make plans to have lunch with mom or, or those kind of cultural things come up, and it's that time of year. But, but what is it that I'm really celebrating? Is this a celebration, or, or is this just some ritual or habit, but I'm living like there's... No hope, grieving like at a funeral where there would be no hope. I think sometimes it's, it's putting on the grave clothes instead of the celebration clothes. You know, I, I picked out what I was going to wear today. I don't always wear a suit. This is not like the dress code here at Grace Point. Our dress code is this. Wear whatever you want to, just wear enough of it. That's our only dress code. But I was reminded as I was thinking about this message today of, of a funeral director friend I have in Ohio. He said, Brady, you know, sometimes when I'm meeting families, I don't know if this funeral is going to be a celebration or if it's going to be deep, deep sorrow because there's no hope. And he said, my opinion is I found the best attire for me to wear. I wear a gray suit with dark black tie. He says, because there's just enough light in there that if I find it's a celebration, I can celebrate with them. And if it's, if it's dark and, and, and despair, I can join with them in that despair. I don't know how I feel about that, but I, I picked out what I would typically wear at a funeral or something like that. As we talk about the victory, how often are we clothed in grave clothes? I thought about putting grave clothes on. I'm not quite sure what that was. I was concerned about a wardrobe malfunction, so I just thought I would go with, with this. You know, what they expected, something different came. Was it celebration or was it lament? They weren't really sure what was going on. I believe the Lord wants to speak to us in this scripture today, that the scriptures he has for us today on a topic that may seem very familiar. And, and if we're not careful, we'll say, oh, yeah, I know what's happening here. But, but could I caution us to say, do we really know what it is we're celebrating? Does the Lord want to speak fresh and new? You know, to the rest of the world, the globe, much of the globe knows what the sport cricket is. I am not one of those people. In fact, until a year and a half ago, I had never watched a cricket match in my entire life. But one of my friends, Amarajeth Da Silva, his son, Amshi, he is a tremendous cricket player. Talented, skilled, gifted. In fact, he's on the national team for Sri Lanka playing cricket. And there was a championship game that was going to be broadcast, streamed over the internet. And I told uh, Amarajeth, I said, I want to watch Amshi, your son, play in this championship game. So he told me how to log in and how to stream it. And, and I'm there in my living room, and I am watching cricket for the very first time. I'm ready to celebrate and cheer, but I have no idea what I'm watching. I don't know what's supposed to happen. I don't know if it's points or goals or I think wickets or I'm not sure what's supposed to. But I knew Amshi's number. And when I would see that number come on the screen, I would just cheer and shout. And I couldn't tell if we were winning or losing. I didn't know how long it was going to be. I felt so out of it. But I wanted to enter in. And I wonder on a Palm Sunday like this, not just at the original Palm Sunday, but even Palm Sundays after, how many times we find ourselves saying, 
I want to enter in in the celebration. It seems like everybody else has joy, uh, but I find myself in grave clothes. I find myself feeling this disconnect of my heart isn't really celebrating. What is going on? But I believe the Lord has a message of victory for us today. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus was a lamb led to the slaughter. But he was no victim. He was and he is the victor. Today I want to share with you a message, Jesus is the victor. On this Palm Sunday, we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The crowds cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet we know it won't be too long until these same people will cry out, crucify him. What the crowds celebrated as victory as they crowned Jesus king of their own idea was not the real true victory that I think God wants us to be gripped by today. When you walk through Palm Sunday, through the Passion Week, all the way up to Good Friday, all the way up to Easter Sunday that we're going to be celebrating, no doubt the original onlookers would have experienced what looked like absolute defeat. No victory in sight. Even the disciples, they grieved and felt that all hope of victory had been stolen from them. If you'd like to take notes, here's a first thought. Maybe you'd want to take it on the app or, or jot it down. To put victor and cross in the same sentence seems to be a contradiction. The most powerful person in the universe Succumbing to such a humiliating and violent death is one of the greatest paradox in all history. For a human perspective, the two, victor and cross, cannot and do not go together. The cross, an instrument of death, humiliation, and defeat, not victory. But upon revisiting the passion of Christ, once again, we are forced to reconsider who really is the victim and who is the victor in this account of the Easter story, of the Passion Week, the final week before Christ's death and resurrection? As Jesus is placed on trial for his life, who is the real victor? A terrified governor? Roman justice? A squad of soldiers? A proud Pharisee? No, Jesus is clearly the victor. Pilate could have had no power over Jesus had not God given him the ability to do so in that moment. And when the Roman soldiers placed king of the Jews in mocking him over his head on the cross, to the Pharisees' dismay, what they really were doing was declaring to the world the truth about who Jesus was and is. Even on the cross, they couldn't shut him up and keep him from forgiving sins. He was forgiving sins even on the cross. The Apostle John tells us that it's his spirit, the very spirit of Christ, was not taken from him, but the victor willingly gave up his spirit. Underlying the raw facts and details of the crucifixion of Jesus is this ever-growing, building crescendo of a king marching to victory with each curse hurled at him, with each lash of a whip upon his back, with each blow of the hammer upon the nails piercing his body, it is the final proclamation of a victor. It is finished. Jesus had victoriously completed salvation's work for you and me and for all mankind. If there is one message I believe the Lord wants to grip our heart with on this Palm Sunday, it's this. The cross, the cross of Christ was no crushing defeat. It was a clear and decisive victory. Oh, I, oh, I know, I know, I've heard this. I've, I've heard about Easter before. I've heard about Palm Sunday before. But I think the Lord is saying, no, 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 let me help you come face to face with the real victory. The cross of Christ is not a crushing defeat. It is a clear and decisive victory. One of my favorite parts of our parading our children through in the second service, they all had, many of them had done this before, and there was a few of them that weren't so sure they wanted to do it again. And as their teacher or leader was kind of dragging them by the hand, they kind of were waving their palm branch like this, Hosanna, I guess I'm blessed. 
It's one thing for a young child, but God help us when our adult response to this victory that has come is, I, I, I guess, God, would you peel back and expose the lie of the father of all lies, calling us to some kind of pomp and circumstance and ritual as we're cloaked in burial grave clothes? Would you help us enter into the real celebration of your victory? The cross of Christ was no crushing defeat. It was a clear and decisive victory. Why? Well, look at that. Only as you and I are convinced of Christ's victory over Satan on the cross in our behalf will we experience consistent victory in every arena of our life here today. See, the purpose of God's message today is to remove from us any doubt of Christ's victory over Satan. And further, it's to show you how Christ, through the cross, totally defeated and disarmed Satan of any legal right he has over your life. I'm going to use some legal language today because there is a very legal aspect of what's happening. It's just as God the judge is there and Satan the prosecutor, the accuser is there and Jesus our advocate, our attorney is there and what is said about you and me is absolutely true and the justification that God offers to us in Jesus is a legal term because there has been a legal right restored because of what happened in Jesus And until we understand where all this came from, we miss the true celebration of this victory. You see, the enemy is consistently seeking to persuade us that he, the enemy, is almost, if not quite, as powerful as God. And unfortunately, in many cases, he has successfully concealed from you and me the truth of what actually happened to him, Satan, at Calvary. So I want to look at the conflict of all ages. And this is what's happening here, and it starts all the way at the beginning. God's redemptive plan begins not with a conquest of gaining new territory. No, it's the repossession and the pushing back of an angelic rebellion. You see, it's this angelic rebellion that starts at the beginning that we need the Lord's word to teach us on to help us see what is actually happening. The devil, Satan, Lucifer, most likely an archangel, led a rebellion against God. And as a result, he and a large number of an angelic host were cast out of heaven. One place we read about it is in Jude chapter 1, the first part of verse 6. Here's what it says. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. The scene now moves from heaven to earth. Enter in man into the picture, an expression of God's creative love, made in his image and given authority over all the earth. God grants the authority of man over the beings of the earth as a bona fide gift. Then the earthly legal gift that God gave to man to govern the earth is called into question when Adam and Eve choose to disobey God and to accept the temptation from the enemy to obey selfishness, sinfulness, to obey Satan over God, surrendering all the God-given authority that God had given to them and now in turn giving and living under the power of Satan, becoming slaves to him. You say, well, where do we find that in Scripture? There are lots of places, but here's one, Romans 6, 16. Don't you realize that you become the slaves of whatever you choose to obey, just like Adam and Eve chose to obey the sinful temptation of Satan? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteousness or right living, righteous living. In that moment, Satan became the legal owner of Adam and his seed, and the earth became his dominion. It was lost by man, and it could be only legally recovered by a man. A sinless member of Adam's race had to be found who could reclaim what Adam lost, the heritage and the dominion that he gave up and gave over to Satan. But this seemed hopeless because all of Adam's seed are born as slaves to sin. What that means is every one of us is born with a bent towards evil. Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
You're beginning to see an impossible situation. But God, he finds a way not to sweep the sin underneath the rug, not to short-circuit his own pure holiness, but to redeem you and I. Galatians 4 talks about it. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Don't miss it. This was the divine mystery of the incarnation. Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit, was God in the flesh, fully God. He was the seed of Adam, not the fallen seed of Adam, but because he was born of a woman, he was fully human, fully God, fully man. He could now represent mankind before God. Yet because he was born without sin, Satan had no legal claim over him. It is at this point that the conflict of the ages boils down to a person-to-person conflict between the prince of peace and the prince of of this world. Since Satan had no dominion over Jesus, it remained for him to try to induce some moral flaw of rebellion in Jesus' character or conduct. There was only one way to do this. Satan must persuade or compel Jesus to break fellowship with the Father. He would try to pressure Jesus into acting independent of the Father. This became the master plan of the enemy, his counterattack. The stakes now grow very high. All the destiny of the world and the human race hang upon the outcome of this struggle between the prince of peace and the prince of this world. If he could by any means at his command prevail upon Jesus, just one thought out of harmony with the Father, just one action departing from the Father's will, then he would have declared that he was the victor and say he was the undisputed ruler of the world. From Bethlehem to Calvary, the battle raged between the Prince of Peace and the Prince of this world. He comes to tempt Jesus at the beginning of his earthly ministry, offering him a shortcut to the world domination with a crossless conquest. Saying, you don't need to go the Father's plan. You don't need to go to the cross. You don't need to suffer. You just speak it, and it will happen the way you want, your plan, your way, not the Father's way. We find this in Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. You see, Jesus overcame the temptation the same way that you and I can overcome. By depending on the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the word of God. The battle continues through his brief but powerful three-year ministry and rises to an incredible pitch that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe it's here that this is the decisive battle. Satan knows his time is, is running out. So he rallies all of the demonic forces that he can with one intensified attack against Jesus. And it's here that we see Satan's gamble in Gethsemane. The demonic pressure upon Jesus was immense. It was so oppressive that it brought him to the very brink of death. We find this in Mark chapter 14. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want Your will to be done, not mine. With those words, Satan lost his gamble. In humble submission, Jesus accepted the cup of suffering that was required for you and me to be redeemed from our sin. 
as we read the events that follow, Jesus seems unmoved by the trauma inflicted upon him. He has his great heart set unwaveringly to do the will of the Father. Even through the false accusations of a kangaroo court, through the mockery and scourging from Roman guards, through the torturous road to Golgotha, even through the horrific act of the crucifixion. Jesus endures them all with the calm serenity of one who has resolved to finish the task no matter what. Then he comes to that final moment forsaken as he's hanging on the cross. In that moment, the hounds of hell are thirsting for his blood, and the Father has hid his face from the Son. His great heart was broken, and Jesus bowed his head, gave up his spirit willingly, and died. Listen closely, friend. Don't miss it. Our grave clothes required? Is hope lost? Is this the gloom and doom? See, when Jesus died without failing in the smallest detail, his death resulted not only in atoning for our sin, but also in defeating Satan's purpose to obtain a claim on Jesus himself. In doing so, he also canceled all of Satan's legal claims upon the earth and the entire human race. How did it happen? When Satan secured the death of Jesus... He became, for the first time in his age-long struggle to usurp God's power, a murderer. He, the enemy, who had the power of death given to him, had the legal right to slay hundreds of millions of Adam's race because they chose to become slaves to sin. But now he who had exercised this power on you and me, he had full immunity, now committed the most colossal mistake of his diabolical career. In his desperate effort to break Jesus' oneness with the Father, he brought the death sentence upon himself as he brought this innocent man to death who he had no legal claim on. This is the core truth of Christ's conquest on the cross. Only when the results of Calvary are clearly appraised does it appear that the cross of Christ was the triumph of all the ages. Don't misunderstand me, friend. It's in this moment where we're not sure what clothes do I wear? Do I celebrate here? Do I mourn here? Is this good news or is bad news? Is this something that I just keep as some kind of a ritual part of this time of year? Or does it actually mean something for me here and now? It is in this moment the triumph of all ages happens when everyone else thinks all is lost. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about it. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. See, it's in Jesus' action that he not only cleansed from us the penalty of sin, but he breaks the back of the power of sin. He breaks the back of Satan himself. He is defeated in that moment. He's not bound and cast into the lake of fire yet, but it is over. It is finished. It is done. There is no question of who is the victor. What does that mean to us on this Palm Sunday of 2021? I've, I've waved the branch before. I've heard the scripture before. What does it mean to me now? Hey, friend, let God remove any doubt of Christ's victory over Satan. Although God has allowed Satan a certain amount of time until he will be bound and cast into a lake of fire, the truth is that all of his legal claims upon you are canceled in Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know this. Satan doesn't want you to think that the cross was a defeat of him. He doesn't want you to think it's a victory for you. He wants you to think it's just something you celebrate. You know what? I'm convinced the enemy is way more content with us celebrating Palm Sunday, us celebrating Good Friday, us celebrating Easter, as long as we keep the cross and the victory of Jesus arm's length from our everyday life. 
Because if it just becomes some kind of a religious holiday, if it just becomes some kind of a pomp and circumstance, we're not sure what clothes to wear, we're not sure how to dress, we're not sure how to speak to it, because it is so far apart from how I live my everyday life, Satan will settle for that. Because he was defeated in that moment. His hold over you is crushed in that moment. He doesn't want you to think about it. He wants to tempt you, as he tempted Jesus, to embrace the ideal of a crossless life. Don't miss this. This is for somebody today. Just as Satan went to Jesus to try to get him to depart from the Father's will, hey, do it this way. Do it your way. You don't need to go to a cross. You're the Son of God. He will tempt you and I to think, I could live this life. I don't need to suffer. I don't need to join him in his suffering, in his death. I'm just going to join him in his resurrection. I, I don't want any of these problems. But the problem is, Jesus himself, and John 16, the end, maybe around 30, 33, in this world, you will have trouble or tribulation. But take heart. Why? Because we're wearing grave clothes. Take heart, for I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Well, that's just my sin, and I live my life here and now, and my sin is what gets in the way of, of like eating ice cream with Jesus in heaven. Hey, friend, this is a misunderstanding of what heaven is, a misunderstanding of what Jesus calls for us here and now. He says, I have no more separation between you and me because of what my son has done on the cross for you. There is victory now. Satan has no hold on you. But why do we live as slaves to fear? Slaves to death when we have already experienced the victory in Jesus. This was his ploy to defeat Judas, one of Jesus' 12 closest followers. When Jesus started talking about dying on a cross, Judas was like, ah, it's got to be a better way. It didn't fit into his idea of a victorious Messiah. So he took things into his own hands, thinking he's going to help God out to do it his way. If we go back to the scene with Jesus and the 12 on that night as they're celebrating the Passover. There in the upper room, Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body which is broken for you. He takes the cup containing the fruit of the vine and he says, this is my blood which is shed for you. Jesus, knowing us as humans so well, says, do this to remember me. What? Remember that my victory that you're going to see is not detached from who you are. It is tied to who you are. See, what the disciples would later realize and what you and I must realize today is that Christ's victory is my victory. Would you say that with me? Christ's victory is my victory. Let's do it one more time at home. I know like no one's there with you. It may feel weird. You can do this. Say it out loud. Christ's victory is my victory. But to just say it is one thing, but I must claim that by putting my weight, my trust on him. We must see through Satan's deception and put our faith in Christ's cross alone, receiving victory over sin and victory over Satan himself. Don't miss this. You see, Satan, he is the master of making your life look more like a defeat than a victory. He's a master at it. He's the master at making you think you need to put on your grave clothes because things are looking bad. Things are really horrible. Things aren't going according to plan. There is no hope. He's a master at making your life look like there is a defeat when victory has already been won. But when he comes with his lies and his deception, remember that things are not always as they appear. We think of another scene that looked like defeat. In the gathering darkness and gloom hung the lonely form of the Son of Man on the cross. His thorn-crowned head falls down upon his blood-stained chest. Yes, it looked much more like a defeat than a victory. But the Father knew. The angels knew. Christ knew. Satan knew. And now you and I know that he uttered those immortal words, It is finished, and victory was his. Jesus became the victor and won the victory for you and me on the cross. Some of us today need to call Satan's bluff in his lies in our life today. 
See, he has a gun pointed at you saying, go ahead. Just make my day. Go ahead and try to put into practice what this preacher guy is saying. Christ can't help you. That's for some super spiritual saint. There's no hope for you. There's no victory for you. Your lot in life has no victory in it. You're doomed to failure. You can call Satan's bluff today because the gun he has pointed at you is empty. Jesus took all of the bullets out when he died for you on the cross. All Satan can do is use fear and intimidation to get us to believe his lie. Friend, today, I believe on this Palm Sunday 2021, God is calling for today to be a liberation day. Satan is fine with us celebrating Palm Sunday, fine with us celebrating Good Friday, fine with us celebrating Easter, and put on whatever you're going to put on to straddle the fence, maybe a little bit of gray in case people are celebrating, you can celebrate, maybe a little bit of black, so when you see someone in gloom and doom, you can join them in that, but we're, we're back and forth in the tug of war, and this is just some kind of a religious ritual, it has no variance on my life, Satan would love you to buy into that lie. But Jesus has planned for this to be Liberation Day again today. If there is an area where the enemy has kept you bound and defeated, I want to challenge you to call Satan's bluff this morning. I'm asking you to join with me. In fact, right now, would you just stand with me? And as you stand, I want to invite you to testify that by faith, by faith you are trusting in Christ's mighty victory in your behalf. Not denying that it may look dark, not denying that your body may hurt, not denying that that relationship is fractured, not denying that that doubt keeps plugging you, not denying all those things, but in the midst of it where Satan says, look, see, it's all defeat, by faith, stand in there and declare Christ's victory is my victory now. Not someday, not if I can get my act together, and not if I can figure it all out and if I can timeline it all out. No, right now, because of who he is, not because of who you are, victory is yours in Jesus. Friend, this is powerful. I want you to, to look with me. This is powerful. I want you to join with me in claiming the victory, the freedom over the power of the enemy, of sin and Satan himself by the name of Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. In just a minute, we're going to sing together. But there's many of you, maybe all of you, who have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. As I pray, I want you to pray silently with me as I pray aloud, declaring the victory that Jesus has given to you and the salvation he's extended to you. Maybe you're here today and you have not prayed asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. As I pray, I want you to pray with me silently as I pray aloud and I want you to do that. If you're watching at home, I want you to do that with me as well. It's not so important that you say every one of these words right. This is not like a magic formula, some kind of a spell that we say these certain words this way. No, it's about my heart declaring this to Jesus. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are my victor. Jesus, I renounce the lies of the enemy in my life and I confess my sin to you. Jesus, I confess my failure to you. And I place my hope and trust in your victory for me on the cross today. Father God, I receive your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Lord, would you help me be gripped by the truth and not Satan's lie today, that Satan's legal authority over me is removed in your name, Jesus. Sin's curse on me is broken in your name, Jesus. Lord, I want to walk in the freedom in your name, Jesus. I declare what you say about me, Jesus. I am victorious in your name because of who you are. Amen and amen. Just before we go, I can't think of a better response 
to invite you to let your mouth declare so your own ears can hear your voice declare the victory that is yours in Jesus. So as our team leads us in this song, don't listen to them sing. I mean, that's fine. They're declaring victory that Jesus has given them. But you get in on it. I could care less if you're on tune. I could care less if you know the words of the song. Jesus could care less of those two things. He wants your heart to not only declare to him the victory that's in Jesus, he wants you and me to walk in to be gripped by the victory that is already won for us in Christ. Let's sing it to him now. victory in Jesus. Amen. You know, church, it'd be real easy just to slip out and go right now. And if, if you have to, you're always free to go. But I feel prompted again. There may be somebody here. You say, I want victory. I hear what you're saying. My heart believes the victory, but I feel like Jesus there in the garden of Gethsemane. It's the dark night of the soul. And I say, is there anybody who would pray with me? Is there anybody who would wait with me? The agony is real. The oppression is real. The enemy is giving attack after attack after attack, trying to get you to do anything in your character, anything in your conduct to depart from the Father's will. And it is just a weight on you. You say, easy for you to sing victory. I'm feeling the jaws of defeat come around me. Friend, you're not alone. And we want to pray with you today. If you would like someone to pray for you, I'm not going to call you out by name. I'm not going to stick a microphone in your face and embarrass you in any way. But you say, you know what? That's me. I want victory. But I'm feeling the oppression of the enemy. And I need some brothers and sisters to stand with me and to wait with me and to let the victory of Jesus bring freedom from my heart. If that's you, I just want you to put your hand up and put it right back down. You just put it up and put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You just put your hand up and put it right back down. Thank you. Good, good. If you're at home, I know it feels weird. You just do it. You just do it. You just do it. You just put your hand up by faith. I can't tell if you're doing it or not. I think you are. Put it back down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise that. I'm not going to call you by name. I'm not going to put a microphone in your face. But if, if you raised your hand, I want you to join me right up here. Just come stand up here. We're just going to pray together. We're going to surround you with brothers and sisters and pray. You just come. Where's my wife? Come here. Let's come. You just come right down. If you raised your hand, you just come and stand right here with me. Very good. Very good. Come right on up here. <clears throat> Just stand wherever you want to. Just stand here. Very good. All the way up here. All right. Here's what I want us to do, church. Very good. Just spread out in a line. Just spread out in a line. Spread out in a line this way. Right over here. Right over here. You're doing so good. You have no idea how good you're doing. This is perfect. This is perfect. Thank you. I don't want anybody standing by themselves. Church, if your faith is strong today, not because of who you are, but because of what Jesus has done in you, I want you to come, and we're just going to put a hand on a sister or a brother, and we're going to pray for them. We're not going to ask them any embarrassing questions, but we're going to not leave them alone. I want you to come right now. Come right now. If you don't have victory, don't come. But if you have victory in Jesus, come. Just put your hand on a brother and sister's shoulder. Satan hates this. This is powerful stuff. He wants you to think about lunch. He wants you to think about plans. That stuff's going to happen. We don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I believe the Lord is going to release his word over our brother and sister today. All right, let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for my brother and sister. I thank you, Lord, for their transparency. And they say, Jesus, here I am. The enemy is pressing in hard. Lord, we don't look down on them today. We don't come with condemnation against them today. We lock our arms with our brother and sister and say, this is my sibling and you, Jesus. This is my family, and I stand with them. And so, Jesus, we cry out to you. Lord, would you take away the lie of Satan that is speaking this vile poison into their ear that they are lost, they are defeated, that there is no hope in this situation. Lord, I pray against that physical pain right now. I pray against that report from the doctor right now that is threatening to take any kind of hope out of their life. Lord, I pray against that fractured relationship right now that is threatening to, to take any kind of victory out of their view because they see the pain that is happening. Jesus, right now, not because of what we say or how we say it, not because of who we are, but it's your word that says to, to pray the prayer of faith over brothers and sisters and you will bring healing. And so, Lord, we ask, we, we anoint our brothers and sisters with your spirit, Lord. Would you bring healing of emotions? Would you bring healing of, of pain in hearts? Would you bring healing of bodies right now in your name, Jesus? Lord, I thank you for the victory. Lord, I pray that you would bring deliverance today from a thought that we are going to live a crossless life. Would you bring deliverance, Jesus, from, from this idea that comfort is what reigns in our heart, that good things happening every single moment of our life, that is the evidence, Jesus, of, of what you want in our life. Jesus, I pray that you'll help victory to come in the midst of this pain. So, Lord, right now I pray for that brother or sister who is in the middle of suffering. Jesus, this, this is what you said, and this is Romans you didn't cause this. This is the result of a fallen world. But this pain, this loss, this crisis, Lord, what the enemy has intended for evil and destruction, Lord, I pray that you will take for this brother and sister who loves you, turn it upside down, and you bring good out of it. So in the midst of this suffering, Jesus, in the midst of bearing this cross, Jesus, I pray that victory will come. Why weeping lasts for a night, rejoicing comes in the morning. Lord, I pray right now that the light of dawn will break in in their heart, Jesus. I pray against the enemy's pressure on that emotion right now. Your, your word, as David declares, why so downcast, O my soul, put your trust in God. Lord, I pray your scripture over them today, that a downcast spirit will not grip them, that the hopeless feeling will not grip them, Lord, but the truth of your victory will, will grab deep in their heart. Lord, I pray right now for the person who's in their seat that for whatever reason didn't come forward or the person who's at home they're, and they're by themselves. Lord, I pray that you would remind them that you have not left them and forsake them. And while they feel alone, and maybe they are physically alone, they are not apart from you. And Jesus, I pray that your victory that was there when you declared it is finished. Few people had celebration clothes on. Most were clothed in grave clothes of depression, of discouragement and defeat. But Lord, Father God, you knew. You knew what was happening. And Lord, I pray that you'll break in right now to that friend at home, that you know what is happening right on the edge where they feel like they are coming to the edge of death, Jesus. Break through in their heart and let victory overcome them. Now, Lord, I ask, Will you protect us from ourself of celebrating some good feeling? Lord, I thank you for creating us as emotional beings. And emotions, they make a good slave, but a horrible master, a good caboose, but a bad engine. And Lord, I thank you that where there is motion, there is emotion, but we're not led by our emotions. And Lord, protect us from, from uh, searching or striving for some kind of a feeling. But Lord, this real hope and victory today, I pray, Jesus, that you would compel us in our hearts to be a witness of what we've seen and heard of you today. So these brothers and sisters who are surrounded by people, they didn't count on this. They didn't plan on this. Nobody up front planned on being up front today, but you had a plan for it. Would you help us witness about what we have seen of you? So by faith, Jesus, we thank you for the victory that is ours in you. By faith, Jesus, 
We are looking for the divine appointment you're going to give us this week to speak that faith to another brother or sister. It's in your name I pray these things. Amen and amen. Amen. You may want to find your place to your seat or stay there, wherever you want to do, that's fine. Brothers and sisters, if you're at home, I'm thankful for this tool that we can talk like this. What I don't like about this tool is is we don't know what you're going through. I believe a day is coming soon when you can be here with us and we could wrap our arms around you. But would would you tell somebody today what you prayed? Would you tell somebody today so we can stand in the gap with you? If you're here and someone was putting your arms around you and and you were receiving that brother or sister praying for you, don't keep it to yourself. Most people will come on Easter Sunday if they're asked. Not everybody, but most. Most. I could care less about how many people we have in the room. I could care a whole lot, my whole life worth, on giving this victory we talked about to somebody else. Just before you go, check this out, as if that wasn't enough. Here's what the Lord tells us in Romans 6. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. As we have crosses to bear in this life, there is no more sin, there's no more fear, there's no more shame. It is all victory in Jesus. And this life is short and the next life is long. Wherever you go, you may choose to stay here and sing a little bit. You may choose to go and have lunch. I don't know what you're going to do, but do it in the victory of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're free to go or free to stay.